Okay, in this case study, we're going to take a brief look at the simple pendulum. And a simple pendulum is nothing more than a small mass, which is at the end of a relatively long string. Now, what constitutes relatively long? Well, the longer the better. Um, the string should be at least three or four times longer than the pendulum bob itself. So what I mean by that is this. Um, if you have a mass on the end of a string, you're going to want that string to be at least three to four times as long as that mass. A simple pendulum can be approximated as simple provided that the angle of oscillation is small. And the angle of oscillation is going to be relative to a vertical line that we draw right here. This angle right here, theta, this angle needs to be approximately less than 10 to 15 percent. Okay, it's a little bit different depending on your source, um, but it's about 10 to 15 percent. 15 percent really is on the high end. But here's the thing when you're around 10 percent, the amount of error from your predicted value with reality is approximately 1%. So what we do with a simple pendulum is very accurate for anything that we're going to do. But the fact of the matter is this is actually a, a complicated um, uh, differential equation, you know, advanced mathematics, if you wanted to find out exactly what the period is going to be. So we make a couple of assumptions with the simple pendulum. One, that the angle is small because we use the small angle approximation. And the small angle approximation says nothing more that than sine theta is approximately equal to theta, and this is in radians, must be in radians, but sine theta is approximately equal to theta whenever the angle is less than 10 degrees. So that's our small angle approximation. The length of our pendulum is going to go from the center of that pendulum bob to the pivot point. And so this becomes the length of our pendulum. And the pendulum is going to follow a path that is semicircular. It's going to look something like that. And the length of that path is going to be equal to 2 times the amplitude because the amplitude basically goes from here to here. Now, one of our assumptions with the simple pendulum is that the height of the pendulum is not changing, but the force is. And if you were to go through the mathematics of it, you would see that there is a teeny, teeny, tiny height change as a result of that pendulum swinging but we can approximate that as being no height change so that the length of the path s is actually equal to two times the amplitude so it's really important that you realize that the simple pendulum is an approximation only that there will be some error in our calculations. It just doesn't affect us, okay? Um, it is not true simple harmonic motion, but for purposes of the AP exam, we will treat it as simple harmonic motion. Okay. So what's happening here? Well, we have the force of gravity is pointing straight down. And gravity has a component, one which is perpendicular to the ramp. So that's FG perpendicular. Sorry, not a ramp. Uh, perpendicular to the motion. And at this point in space, we can see our motion as being... Um, as being like it's on a ramp, right? If that would approximate our ramp. But of course, as the angle changes, 
the ramp flattens out, but this is just to help you understand the physics behind what's causing the acceleration. And then we have FG parallel is parallel to the motion. And uh, let's see, this is FG parallel. And this is what's causing our acceleration. So our acceleration or our force, I should say, goes from something large when it's out here so that when you're in that vertical up and down position, FG parallel is zero and we have zero acceleration. So the cause of our changing acceleration is the result of that angle and gravity is what's causing us to accelerate. So without proof, T equals 2 pi times the square root of L over G. Now, um, we can also write this in terms of frequency, and you don't have to know both ways. All you need is one, and then you can convert back and forth one to the other. If you know the period, you can get the frequency. If you know the frequency, you can get the period, and that's because the relationship is one over T. Frequency is equal to one over T. So this is one over two pi times the square root of g over l okay and what this means in terms of omega well remember that frequency was 2 pi times omega so if we move this 2 pi to the other side what we see is that omega is equal to the square root of g over l Okay, so I just have a couple of really quick questions for you. And the first one is, does mass matter? In other words, does the mass of my pendulum bob make a difference to the period of the pendulum? The answer, of course, is no. Can you explain why? Take a moment and see if you can explain why. I think the easiest way to explain is, well, there's two perspectives we could take on this. The first perspective would be kinematics. And in kinematics, we know that all objects fall with the same acceleration when an object is in free fall. And with the pendulum, the object isn't technically in free fall, but we can think of it as a form of controlled free fall because gravity is the only force acting on the object, which can at all influence the speed of the object. Tension is always perpendicular to the motion and so it does no work. So in short, from a kinematics perspective, we can say that it's in a form of controlled free fall and mass doesn't matter when it comes to free fall. The other perspective we could take on it is Newton's second law. And in Newton's second law, we know that F net is equal to MA and and so the acceleration is equal to F net over M. And all objects will have the same ratio of F over M because we get MG for F net, and I'll say MG uh, sine of theta divided by the mass, and so the masses cancel out we're just left with acceleration. So that's the reason why the mass of the object does not matter.